Revelation 5, however, turn to um, Revelation, oh, let's see here. How about, yeah, Revelation 20. Turn there, because this has to do with... um, where we're at on looking at things that are sealed in the Bible, the book in God's right hand in Revelation 5, his right hand, is sealed with seven seals. And um, I did a study just to understand what those seals represent. Um, And... We looked at last week, let's see here, I'm not going to go back over all this. Seals are used by governments to show authority or force of law or like a treaty. There is, there is an official great seal of the United States. It's actually a, there's a man who is in charge of that seal. And there's actually this big stamp thing that they use to stamp international treaties and documents, things like that, to show that they are enforced by the United States of America and they're kept by the United States of America, although sometimes we're not very good at keeping treaties. Uh, Just ask the Native Americans that. Uh, Seals are used to show binding consent, as in a contract. When you put your seal down on that paper, you better know what you're signing They always tell you to read everything on it, and I would encourage you to do so. Notary seals shows that parties to a contract have been legally identified. And in today's world, that is important, especially with identity theft, such as it is. Uh, I won't ask if you've ever had your identity stolen. Uh, Anybody ever had funny charges show up on their credit card? That happens, okay? And the best thing to do is call the company because they, I was watching a YouTube video the other day. Somebody had it on his, in a 7-Eleven. They had a skimmer on there. I think I talked about that. They had a skimmer, a credit card skimmer, and it was just a faceplate over the credit card reader they had in there. And it, was, it matched perfect the credit card reader. And this lady went in there. She knew that that 7-Eleven was the last place she used the card. And she's recording this on her phone. And she tells the clerk. And the clerk is going, well, there's nothing wrong with this. And she reaches over and goes like that and pulls it off and goes, yeah, there is. And kind of makes you think about the employees who work there. But anyway, I don't know who was responsible for it. And we have the scriptures that denote that. And then... The third thing seals represent, I think there's four things here. Seals denote secrecy. Things that are kept hidden, sealed documents or sealed records that are not for public viewing or knowledge. Um, Who's ever heard of this phrase, First Amendment auditor? You know what they are? People who need a job, number one, is who they are. It's these sovereign citizen people who think that because a courthouse is a public building, that they have a right to go in with a camera and record everybody that's in the you know, courthouse. Yeah, everybody that, and they take a camera inside of a courthouse and try to record what's going on there. And usually it's up to the judge whether he wants things recorded or not. And I don't know about you, but some of my business doesn't belong on the internet for everybody to see. Amen? Okay? Um, Especially in cases like if you have uh, a wife who is being beaten by her husband or something like that and she goes to court to get a protection order against him. She doesn't want that live streamed on Facebook. She does have a right to her privacy in that matter. Juveniles, especially juveniles, in the court system have an absolute right 
to their privacy and any juvenile records usually are sealed, period. And it would take a court order in unusual circumstances to get them unsealed. They're not for public viewing. They're not for public display. But these guys go around thinking they have a right. They're told multiple times. They go in police stations. They go everywhere trying to record. They're told multiple times, stop doing what you're doing or you're going to be arrested. And they say, we have a constitutional right. We're blah, blah, blah. And they always get arrested. Always get arrested. And sometimes it's funny when they get tased and arrested. I love that one. There's a, there's a video. It's, man, it's made the rounds on the internet. This guy is a sovereign citizen. And he, goes, he tries repeatedly to go in this courtroom to record. And they emptied the courtroom out because of him. Stopped all the cases. And when they're ready to go back in, this guy's going to go, I'm going back in the courtroom. I don't care what you say. And this guy pushed him back and he said, you're not going in. And you see him reaching for his taser and the guy charges him. Bam! Tased him, dropped him on the ground. He's crying like a little girl. But there's a reason why some things are sealed. So let me ask you a question. Who would want all of their sins displayed up on that screen there? Any takers? Sealed document. And so read Revelation 20. There will come a time when the deeds of man will be revealed. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And notice this. And the books were opened. What books are those? It's the, the charges. The sins of man are written down in a book. Now I would ask you, how big is your book? Yeah. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. That also is sealed until the end because we are sealed until the end. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So their works are written down and recorded in these books. And those books are sealed. And at the time of judgment, God orders them to be unsealed. Uh, so records that are not for public viewing or knowledge for a period of time. Usually there comes a time when they will be unsealed. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. So we know that the book of Daniel, which for me is even the last six chapters, are difficult to read, much less comprehend. Anybody who says that they've got Daniel unsealed is lying. They're lying. And especially if they're trying to sell you a book or some video on it. Jack Van Impey did that years ago, I remember. He had a whole video cassette series called Daniel Unsealed for your love offering of $75.95 plus $20 shipping and handling. So you're paying out 100 bucks to watch this guy's tapes and he doesn't know what he's talking about. He does not know. He did not know. He did not unseal Daniel. Daniel is sealed and the words are sealed until the time of the end. And I believe at this time, Revelation 5, Revelation 6, when the book is handed to Christ and he begins to unseal and break the seals of that book, then those things then Dan in Daniel will be revealed. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. That's the time. Think about it. Think of the the science and technology that has been developed since 1900. 19, 1909, 1910, somewhere around there, the Wright brothers get it right. And they learn how to fly this big kite that they made for about 100 yards. First flight. It wasn't very long. And it didn't have a motor on it. Then they worked on putting a motor on it. 
got a motor on it and flew that thing quite a distance. Only 60 years went by of man's experience in flight and we're landing on the moon. We're, we're taking off from a moving object, the earth, and landing on another moving object, the moon, and they got it almost dead on right the first time. When Armstrong was looking at the field on the moon where he was supposed to land, they knew they were a little bit over trajectory and where he would have landed, they looked down, him and uh, Buzz Aldrin looked down and it's full of big boulders and they're going, we're not landing this thing sideways on boulders. So he's only got 30 seconds of fuel left to land that thing and with about 10, 12 seconds of fuel left, he finally gently touches down on the moon. Unbelievable that we did that in 60 years. From the time we learned how to safely fly through the air to landing on the moon. I know some people don't believe we did that. I do. I believe we did. 60 years of man, space, or man flight and we're landing on the moon. Now we're talking about sending people to Mars. They're talking about much bigger things in the near future. Warp drive is being worked on. That's known. Okay? Star Trek stuff. Knowledge is increasing exponentially. That means if, like if you, if you ever heard the thing, if you took a penny your first day and doubled it every day, what do you got in five days? One, two, three. You doubled the two, you got four plus the three you got. That's seven. That's three days. Huh? Yeah, 32 cents. And after a month, something like a million dollars if you doubled it every day. That's how knowledge is increasing right now. Okay? Daniel 12, 9. He said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are sealed up. In other words, Daniel, shut the book and leave it alone. Go thy way. Live your life. This is not going to happen. The words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. That's the book of Daniel. Yes? I want to ask you, do you think, myself, I think knowledge is going, too, going way too far. Absolutely it's gone too far. We learned how to read DNA. That was, that was the hard part. Since we learned how to read it, now we know how to change it. That's the bad part. Okay? It's like a person reading the Bible. A new convert reading the Bible. And he's overjoyed with what he reads in the scriptures. And he can't get enough of it. Uh, I remember when God started pouring things into me years ago. I could not read this Bible enough. I could not get enough Bible. Uh, but what happens is... Somebody tells him that something's wrong in the Bible. He starts believing it. And now all of a sudden he's a Bible scholar who thinks he can change whatever he wants to change in the scriptures. He can rest, which means twist, scriptures. So you're right. Too much knowledge. In Revelation 10, however, uh, we have the seven thunders. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices... John said, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And I always thought, ugh, he was about to write them. Don't you wish you knew what they were? Now, I don't know, but I bet you one thing. I bet you they're written in this book, only John didn't write it. Okay, because I can't think of anything that God would, and thunders are God's voice. When God said, this is my beloved son, they, some said it thundered. Okay, and you can read that all through the scriptures. The Lord thundered with his voice. So I think it's God's voice. I think God's saying something. And I think he said it seven times. And I think it's in this book. But John didn't write it. Okay. And do I know what they are? No, they're sealed up. 
How would I know what they are? They're sealed up. I think they'll be unsealed one of these days. Um, and then you have, in Revelation 10, you have just the opposite. Uh, let's see, is it, is it Revelation 10? Um, can't, I uh, can't think of where it is. Um, John is told to seal not the sayings of this book. Um, Daniel sealed. Revelation is not sealed. The words are there. I think they're plain to us. I think you should take Revelation for what it is and what it says and believe what it says and not try to make something out of it that's not there. Uh, but anyway, that, I can't remember where that is. But Revelation clearly is not sealed. The words that John wrote down are clearly not sealed. So then, you seal things to preserve them for a certain time. Who had a seal a meal back when they came out? Remember what you had to say? What did you have to say, Gloria? You had to count. You had to count. How did you have to count, Gloria? She don't want to say. One seal a meal, two seal a meal, three, right? Am I right? I'm right. Or mom used to can. Dad grew, always grew a humongous garden. At one time had three gardens going. And okra, tomatoes, beans, peas, everything out of that garden, mom's in there canning. And she's listening. What are you listening for, Mom? For the lid to go. It means it's sealed. Got the seal on it. You put the little ring on it, store it away. And you always went around touching the top of it to make sure it hadn't popped out. Okay? Well, what was that for? It, was, it goes back to the days before refrigeration. When they had to figure out how to preserve the crops that they had, you could keep beans, you could keep wheat, you could keep corn, it dried up, you could keep it, potatoes and onions, potatoes especially. Potatoes are like God's miracle food because especially in northern climates, they grew potatoes. Russians grew potatoes and beets because they kept all winter long. And you could eat off of them all winter long until spring and summer came around. You went out and planted some more. So even in some of the simple foods that we eat, God designed them to be self-sealing. Things like wheat, I mentioned corn and things like that, were all given to us by God. Do you think the potato just developed itself in the evolutionary process because it felt sorry for man in the wintertime? No, it, listen, evolution does not make sense. You have to believe that the potato evolved independent of any other process of nature on it, including man. You have to believe that the potato grew in the ground and man just happened to discover this big tuber in the ground when most roots of a plant are this big Here's the potato root, and it's this big. The onion, this big. Things like that. You pull them out of the ground and store them in a cool place, and they'll stay that way. You've got food all winter long if you stored enough potatoes. But scientists are what scientists are. They believe that these developed by accident over time to feed man. It wasn't nature. It was God. Nature's God. Amen? So things are sealed for, to preserve them for a certain time. Deuteronomy 32, verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. I've talked about this many times. Their wine, then, is the poison of dragons, the cruel venom of asps. And then God says, is this not laid up in store with me and sealed up 
among my treasures. What does he mean by that? What are God's treasures? His treasures, I believe, are his word to us. I'm rich because of this book. And the knowledge and the understanding and the wisdom that our Bibles give to us, that God unseals to us at the right time in our lives. Um, DNA works exactly the same way. Just as there are prophecies like this one, this is a prophecy of something that refers to an event in the end times. It is currently, it and its understanding and its realization is sealed up for now. There will come a time when God will unseal it and it will unfold on this world. DNA works exactly the same way. When you are conceived, every, uh, every biological event in your life is written in your DNA at the moment of your conception. Things that are going to happen to you later in life, like adolescence and puberty, then becoming an adult, those things don't happen a year after you're born. Don't give adulthood to children. Which is why you should not teach them sexual issues in kindergarten, Florida. Any, listen, anybody who wants to talk sex to a five-year-old is messed up in the head. They're perverted. So you don't do that with first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade children. At a certain point, you got to talk to your kids. Parents should do that. Not the world. Because there are things they can handle, things they can't. So we don't give voting rights to people until they reach 18. I turned 18 in 1984. You'll never guess who I voted for. It wasn't Fritz Mondale, I can tell you that. Uh, and I was, I was tickled to death to go vote for Ronald Reagan. Tickled to death. Um, but anyway, they don't let 18-year-olds carry weapons, or 17-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 15-year-olds carry weapons. They don't let kids drink alcohol. It's not legal until they reach a certain age. Then it shouldn't be legal. But it is. It's because they're not designed to handle it. Things haven't been unsealed in their genetics. They haven't reached a maturity level yet. That happens later in life. So things sometimes get sealed up and kept until a certain time. Song of Solomon, uh, he says, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is as strong as death. What's he talking about here? I think the Song of Solomon is written like between Solomon and his wife, his beloved wife. He had a, 700 of them, but the one he really liked, his beloved. And it's a picture of Christ... And by the way, the woman that Solomon really loved was a black woman. She says plainly in there, I am black, but I am comely. So a lot of people think it was the queen of Sheba, Ethiopia, that he was in love with. Okay? But um, he's, it, it's written as Christ and his bride, the church. They are in love with one another. And so set me as a seal upon thine heart. In other words, you don't want Jesus looking at some other woman, do you? You don't want your husband, Christ, or your potential husband, your future husband, out whoring around and partying with other women. I watched a documentary. I like to watch documentaries on the um, Windsor family, the Queen of England, 
and her family. And they were talking about Prince Charles. And they told the advice that Prince Philip, who was Prince Charles's father, Queen Elizabeth's husband, the advice that Prince Philip told his son, Prince Charles, when he was out of high school and in military school and training to be king and all this stuff, he told him, son, at some point you're going to choose a wife. But between now and then, go party with the ladies all you want to and all you can. That's the advice that this Christian prince, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, gave to his son, Prince Charles, which is probably reason why he had such a problem holding on to his first wife. He didn't love her, he didn't care about her, and all the while he was married to Diana, he was having an affair with Camilla. Okay, a big scandal until Diana dies all of a sudden. Now Prince Philip, or P Prince Charles is free to marry Camilla. And, but that's the advice that he gave his son. It's crazy stuff. So how would you like to marry, ladies, a husband like that? That went out whoring around all his life until he married you, and now you expect him to be home every night. He's not going to do it. Set me as this, unless he really loves you, set me as a seal upon thine heart. So you can say that Christ and his bride, his true bride, they are going to be faithful to one another even before the marriage. Amen? Even before the marriage, faithful one to another. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as a grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which have the most vehement flame. What's he talking about here? Hell. The jealousy of God leads to hell. Isaiah 8, 16. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait upon... And the, the word disciples was not even used until the New Testament. And it referred to the disciples of Christ. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Notice verse 17. God is binding up a testimony and a prophecy among his disciples. He's sealing it in them. And they have said, we will wait upon the Lord. Think, think of this. When Jesus was with his disciples in Acts chapter 1, he had spent about 40 days with them. And he told them, his, they said, Philip, in fact, Peter said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel? Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that are left in the Father's hand. I think the Father's hand is where the book is. Um, but he tells them to go into Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. So what do the disciples do? They do exactly that. They go to Jerusalem and they wait for God. They don't try to bring God down from heaven. They don't try to rush God. They don't try to pretend that they already have the Holy Ghost. When they don't, they are told to wait. And at a certain time, when God is ready, he then unseals this prophecy of Joel chapter 2, that I pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And boom, on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, that's why it's Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, exactly following the feast days of the Jews, going from Passover to the Feast of Weeks, they were to measure out seven weeks, 49 days, and on the 50th day was a feast. Well, here's the 50th day, and boy, are they feasting. They have the Holy Ghost poured down upon them. They did exactly what Jesus said to do. They waited. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for Jesus to come back in the air, aren't we? How many of you get tired of waiting? You see us down here? 
I get tired of waiting. I want him to come back. I want him to set this world right. I want him to fix me permanently. But I have to wait because the time of his appearing in the clouds is sealed up. It's bound and it will be unsealed at the right time and Jesus will appear in the air. He will do it exactly the way he said he would do it. Okay? Jeremiah 32, and I charge Barak. Oh, I love this story. Turn to Jeremiah 32. Let me just run this, run this story down for you very quickly before my wife rings the bell. She's the bell ringer today. Jeremiah 32. Uh, we got word that David and Emily are not feeling well today. Uh, they're at home watching. David and Emily, we got your message. We love you. We're praying for you. Hope you get feeling better. Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah has told Judah that they're going to be taken into Babylonian captivity. God's had enough. He's done with them. Uh, but he wants them, God wants them to know that he's not finished forever. In Isaiah 54, I think God told Israel something like, even though I get angry for, for a moment, I still love my people. Okay? I get angry at my wife every now and then. I don't know why I do. She gets angry at me. I have no reason why she would ever get mad at me. <laughs> but I don't stay angry. And she knows that. She knows that about me. That she has to push really hard for me to get mad and stay that way. I get mad. I get quiet. I get over it. And we usually don't let the sun go down on our wrath. By the end of the day, we're just as in love as we ever were. And I like it that way. She likes it that way. But God wants Israel to know, even though I'm angry with you now, and I'm taking you out of this land, I'm keeping the land in your name. Okay? So let's say that... Let's say that uh, Brian here um, got drafted in the military. You're going to be a Marine soldier. <clears throat> Semper Fi, right, Ron? And they send him over to Afghanistan or somewhere. Now, when he comes back after doing a three-year tour, he would like to have his vehicle and his house his tools, his wife, and his stuff, okay? So it's all in his name, and just because he has to leave the country for three years doesn't mean he loses it by default. It's in his name. So, Jeremiah 32, God told, tells Jeremiah. Jeremiah is actually in prison at this time. And he says, Jeremiah, I want you to buy the field of your first cousin. It's Hanamiel, your uncle's son. And he said, I want you to buy the field that is in Anathoth, and I want you to buy it for 17 shekels of silver. That number means something. Not going to get into that. So here's what he did. In verse 13, he charged Barak before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase. Even back then, they wrote out a title deed, Sterling. All the way back then, they wrote out a deed to property. And it was legal. A property description. They would give the landmarks, which is why God said in the law, do not move your neighbor's landmark. Don't take your neighbor's property. That's your neighbor's. Don't steal your neighbor's stuff. And he said... Uh, they wrote it all out, and they made two copies. One of them 
just like Revelation and Daniel. One of them was sealed and one of them was open. He said, take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. I love this. First time I read it, I got it. The Holy Ghost said, Mike, think of a verse in the Bible that has earthen vessel in it. And the Holy Ghost gave me this verse out of 2 Corinthians. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's he referring to? He's talking about the word that he has sealed in our hearts with the Holy Spirit of promise. I don't intend to ever walk away from this book. It's, my, it's where my faith is. It's where my only hope and trust is. I quit trusting in politics. I quit trusting in earthly religions. I quit trusting in money. I quit trusting in everything. Else. The only thing I trust and that I have hope in for a better life is in this book right here. So I don't intend to walk away from it ever. So he said, put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. Because he said, um, verse 15, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. So he already told Jeremiah, after 70 years, I'm going to bring everybody back. Daniel reads this while he's in captivity in Babylon. And he understands that after 70 years, God's going to bring them all back. And he does exactly that. And after 70 years, they all come back and they go into the hall of records. And sure enough, there's Jeremiah's field that he bought in Anathoth. He purchased it for 17 shekels of silver. It's his property and he has a right to it when he gets back. Amen. Who did God give the land of Palestine to? Israel. It is their land. Who said so? God said so. And he wrote it in this book. By the way, bell ring. This book has a seal on it. It has a seal on it. It has a king's seal on it. I did not know this until I talked to a man from Nottingham, England. And it's, I've since con, uh, confirmed it. When King James of England authorized, this is why we call it the authorized Bible. When King James of England ordered this to be translated in 1611, when they brought the translation to King James of England, he set upon it what's called the Royal Letters Patent. And what the royal, it's like a patent. That's like if you invented something, you, you invented a tool one time and you wanted to get it patented. Um, if you invent something and it's patented, that means that you own the rights to it for as long as you own it. And if anybody tries to steal it or tries to copy it, and you're the one that came up with it first, they owe you a ton of money. Now they can buy your rights to it, as is, happens a lot of times. Um... I'm getting off track here, but the bottom line is King James put this Bible under a royal seal called the Royal Letters Patent, which means that as long as there a monarch exists in England, this Bible cannot be altered or changed in any way. Somebody say amen. Long live the queen. And after, and I know he's a scoundrel, but after her, long live the king. Because their throne, it's the, one of the few surviving thrones of Europe. All the rest have been done away. That throne protects the, the text of this book. And I believe God ordained it to be that way. Father, bless your word. We thank you for it. Give us knowledge and instruction, Father. We thank you for what we've learned this morning. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen, Amen to that.